Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report now presents a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's outstanding leaders. Now here is Minnesota businessman Arnold Paulson. My name is Arnold Paulson, a businessman from Granite Falls, Minnesota. And I'm very grateful for having this opportunity to moderate this panel for you folks today. We have just completed a Blue Ribbon Conference in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, this conference represented businessmen, civic leaders, educators, uh, economists, and research analysts from 12 central Midwestern states, the key states to the, of the agricultural e economy for the United States. Uh, it's my privilege today to have the opportunity to interview some of the panelists and also a gentleman who was an observer uh, and a participant at this conference. I'd like to introduce our guests at this time. Uh, on my right is Walter Bowers, retired economist from Washington, D.C., who served in government from 1929 through 1944. He worked for the Department of Commerce, the Department of Agriculture, the Treasury Department, the War Department, and he also has, I believe, degrees as a lawyer, as an economist, he's also a geologist, and he's now a rancher and an abstract and runs an abstract office in Yates Center, Kansas, and it's our privilege to have you with us today, Mr. Bowers. Sitting next to Mr. Bowers is Carl H. Wilkin, research analyst from Washington, D.C., who was one of the featured uh, pa uh, speakers at the seminar. On my extreme left is Mr. Harry Ranch, a banker from um, Thayer, Kansas, and also a member of the Agricultural Committee of the Independent Bankers Association of America. And also with us today is Ray Dykman, who is an income tax consultant and an independent insurance agent uh, from Gregory, South Dakota. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to uh, turn our attention to Mr. Bowers. Mr. Bowers also participated on the seminar. He's been an acquaintance of mine now for the past two years, and he brought out something at our conference that I think should be brought to the attention of almost every American. And Mr. Bowers, I wonder if you'd tell the folks at this time about the red schoolhouses and the little white churches. Well, uh, at this conference, uh, someone brought up the point that no one had ever made uh, a study, any research study, of the importance of the single family unit on a small farm to the economy of America. They're talking about dropping the small family unit off of farms and going to big farms. Now, what was the value of this small family unit? Well, I say that there has been a uh, research project uh, in progress in this particular agricultural area for the last 100 years. We had a group of people uh, start moving into this rich Mississippi Valley 100 years ago. And all that distinguished these people from any other people on earth was the fact that they were bringing with them little white churches and little red schoolhouses. A million of them settled in uh, Nebraska before 1900. Two million of them settled in Kansas, and half a million in North Dakota, and half a million in South Dakota, and Iowa, and Missouri, and Minnesota, and the other states of this rich Mississippi Valley. And they, all that distinguished them from people of other parts of the earth was that they had a certain devotion symbolized by little white churches and little red schoolhouses to the principles of the freedom that we have in our private enterprise system in the United States that is not followed anywhere else on earth. And what happened? We had an explosion in this Mississippi Valley that is just as astounding as the explosion of an atom bomb. In a hundred years, in this Mississippi Valley, we have built the greatest bread basket of all history. The greatest corn belt, the greatest wheat belt, the greatest cattle belt, the greatest cotton belt of the entire earth, right here in this particular 
area in the middle of Mississippi Valley. And not only on top of that, we have produced some of the most brilliant scientists of the entire Earth. There are more Nobel Prize winners. Great scientists have come from these agricultural states than any other single spot on Earth. From the little red schoolhouses? The little red schoolhouses and little white churches. They started from that background. In other words, that's been, in your estimation, the key to the fantastic growth of the American society is, and our economy. It has demonstrated to the world what individual human personalities can do with a proper individual education and with the proper spiritual values in their hearts and minds. Well, thank you. I'm sure we'll be back to you before the program's over. At this time, I'd like to turn to the other end of the table and interview Mr. Harry Rash, who's been very much concerned for a number of years in agriculture and also the economy of his state in Kansas and the nation as well. Mr. Rash, you've spent considerable time in research. and You've also worked with the Agricultural uh, Committee for the Independent Bankers. I'd like to have you uh, briefly tell about your research and uh, make whatever statement or observations on our conference at this time. Well, first, I'd like to make a statement regarding the economy of Kansas. In 1965, the farm production in Kansas had a value of a billion and a half dollars, which was the third greatest on record. Still, the realized cash net income was a decrease from the previous year. The realized net cash income. The proposition of trying to make people realize the dependence of the welfare of the entire economy of the state and the nation on the price and production of agricultural products seems to be uh, one of the hardest tasks that I ever, ever saw trying to accomplish. At this conference, it was brought out the relationship of the agricultural production and price to the national economy. In Kansas, four jobs out of 10 are dependent upon agriculture. Uh, I come from uh, southeast Kansas, a little town of Fair, where I've lived all my life, Neosho County. I am at present a member of the Southeast Kansas Regional Planning Commission, appointed by governor of Kansas to make forecasts for uh, uh, the future of our area. I happen to be on the Agricultural Commission because of my interest. The forecasts of uh, population trends, the records on the population in Kansas show that we've had a greater, as great an out-migration as we have of the new births in Kansas. The, a the uh, age of the farm population has, uh, is over the 50 mark. The rest of the nation, I believe they say the average age is 25. Harry, can I ask one question? Most industries, the strength and the growth of most industries is based on uh, the number of young people that enter this specific business or industry. And as a banker now, uh, what's the future of young people entering agriculture with the present price structure, from your observation? The required investment is such that the young person cannot enter uh, agriculture. That is the sad part. The farmers are actually telling their own sons that you shouldn't be entering agriculture, that you have no future, that you will be uh, underpaid and overworked. Do you think that the trends that we're drifting towards is going to be the answer or the solution to agriculture in America? It the large not. type farm or the corporate type farm? The, uh, the large type farm, the corporate farm cannot answer the problem. We have a need for more agricultural production in this country than we actually are producing. The day of the so-called surplus, that's a, a uh, myth and a fantasy. We are dependent upon meat imports now to sustain our need for meat. 
Well, Harry, I'll uh, get back to you again in a minute. At this time, I'd like to uh, call on our good friend from South Dakota, uh, Ray Dykeman. Uh, you've attended our conference here as an observer, and you've also had an opportunity to participate. I'd like to have you make whatever general statements you have on mind in relationship to agriculture in South Dakota and uh, where South Dakota is headed unless we restore farm prices to balance with wages and interest. Well, I became interested in the agricultural program and the decline of rural America while I was attending the University of South Dakota in college in 1958. And since that time, I have been trying to discover what are some of the answers to the farm problems. Why do we not have enough farm income to support the level of farming that they had when I was a boy? Because in the area that I grew up in, South Central South Dakota, near Gregory, South Dakota, there were a lot more farms when I was a boy than there are today. So I was trying to discover what the answers to this problem are. And by attending this conference, I got a lot of the answers to why we've had this decline in rural America and what it will really mean if it continues. Take the period of 1946 to 1950. 70% of South Dakota's earned income came from agriculture. So, due to the fact of underpayment of agriculture between 1951, the difference between 1951 and 1965, South Dakota lost one, nearly $1 billion of earned income. And this is what I'm concerned about, the amount of earned income South Dakota is losing because agriculture is being underpaid today. Well, now, you had an opportunity to associate yourself with many of the other <coughs> uh, people who attended this conference. From your observation, what was their reaction to the uh, discussion that took place and uh, tracing out of the balance sheet and the loss of income for the various states and also the condition of our national economy? What, what did the other people think? What was their observations in your estimation? Of the people that were in attendance at the seminar, Yes. I think we can just about say that there was 100% agreement that they all agreed that agriculture was being grossly underpaid. And due to this underpayment, we were not only undermining agriculture, but we are undermining the whole economic system in the United States. Did it shock many of them to learn the condition of our, not only the state economy, their own state economy, but the national economy? Yes, it did. There was uh, much concern written on many of the faces of the people there. They knew there was a problem, but they didn't know it was as bad as it is today. Well, now, one of the things that we did during this seminar is we had the representatives of each state figure out the actual loss of turtle, total personal income in 1965. And uh, you mentioned that South Dakota lost approximately $1 billion. Uh, some of the other states, uh, Minnesota, for instance, lost two billion two hundred and seventy five million Kansas I believe Harry was short approximately three billion was that right or a little over no, three billion it was under that it was uh, about a billion three yeah, about billion, a billion, billion three hundred and seventy five million that was it um, uh, Iowa's loss was roughly uh, four billion dollars and uh, the reason that the people in all these states were unaware of this loss of uh, personal income is because they've never prepared a balance sheet on their own state economy, so they don't know where they've been, where they're headed, or where they're at. And at this time, I'd like to turn our attention to Mr. Carl Wilkin, a research analyst from Washington, D.C., who we call the father of the balance sheet, because he's been keeping these records on the national economy for, uh, a, for many years. And, uh, Mr. Wilkins, when did you uh, first Red, prepare? Red, just, just one minute to be sure to make this point, that this loss that we're talking about was just for the year 1966, one year. Yes, right, that's... Red, uh, the loss in South Dakota was one, nearly $1 billion for the year 1965. For the 1965. I think we better drive that one home. Thank you uh, for reminding me. Carl, when did you first, uh, when did you prepare your first balance sheet, and what induced you to uh, make such a study, and uh, 
uh, what's going to happen if the American people don't wake up and analyze the records of our economy. Well, briefly, in 1929, I was operating a farm about 80 miles southeast of Sioux City, and the economist said we were never going to have a, another depression. In 1932, I was selling corn for 10 cents a bushel. Well, the AAA program didn't correct it. So uh, I was one of three men who signed the Articles of Incorporation setting up the Raw Materials National Council. And the... Uh, that originated here in Sioux City? Correct. And it's still incorporated right in Sioux City in Woodbury County. In 1941, I prepared my first balance sheet. And as a result, Sioux City is the birthplace of the first balance sheet that was ever prepared. And uh, I've kept a balance sheet ever since that time. And uh, as you know, at the seminar, I presented a balance sheet, 48.50, as a base. And uh, the 15 years which followed, <coughs> pointed out to the audience how they could compute it and uh, had them check the uh, losses of the different groups during that period. Well, now, uh, <coughs> I know that when the uh, group worked out the loss of income uh, for private enterprise, uh, for agriculture, for the corporations and so forth yesterday, they were stunned. Uh, from memory, could you, uh, could you quote the, uh, the, the loss of national income and the loss to corporations and private enterprise during the past, uh, wh whichever period you'd care to select? Well, briefly, in the 15 years following 4850, we underpaid agriculture in terms of gross realized farm income, $370.5 billion. Now, uh, we have a trade turn of seven times the initial dollar farm income. So what happened, we lost seven times this underpayment or newly earned dollars to operate our economy. To offset the loss, we added $884 billion to the gross debt federal state local and private. But in spite of this injection of $884 billion, in the 15-year period, we were still short $627 billion of national income, over $40 billion a year, to balance with wages and interest. Now then, the question is, uh, uh, who lost it? Well, the balance sheet proves that uh, a private enterprise, in terms of Net farm, small business, corporate profits after taxes absorbed $597 billion of that shortage of income. The principal loser was the farm operator who was short $222 billion. The next principal uh, loss was uh, our corporate profit, was short $211 billion after taxes. And finally, the small businessman was short $162 billion. And I would like to point out that uh, a uh, large part of this loss, that is a greater proportion of it, took place in our rural communities because the business, small businessmen in uh, our urban areas, they had the benefit of the uh, terrific increase in uh, the payrolls that took place. Uh, Carl, I hope I have time to come back to you, but I'd like to ask Mr. Bowers another question. I read your balance sheet on agriculture, but yours is from a, 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 a different aspect. You've written or prepared a balance sheet on production, and uh, I'd like to have you comment on that. Uh, what's your attitude about the large type uh, commercial farms and so forth, and is, in your opinion, is that going to work? Well, uh, from my balance sheet viewpoint, uh, my feeling is, talking as a businessman now and not as an economist, as Mr. Wilkin has been talking, uh, agriculture has a better balance sheet than, we'll say, the Iowa Public Service Company has or better uh, balance sheet than uh, the uh, Missouri Pacific or the, uh, the uh, Illinois Central or Northwestern Railroads. Uh, the, the farmer uh, has less debts and more assets than any other segment of our whole economic system. But that isn't true on his operating statement, his income and expense statement. The farmer is not getting as large uh, return on his investment as the Interstate Commerce Commission allows the railroads and allows the utility uh, power and light companies and so forth. And as a result, the farmer is working uh, in the red, so to speak. 
And the only way he shows in the black is the government subsidies that he's getting from Washington. The farmer before, the average farmer in America, before his salary and before his taxes and before his uh, new uh, equipment and before his paying his debts is only averaging $350 a month. And the average farmer probably has an investment of $100,000, four or five times that of a service station manager, and he should be earning 6000 a year minimum after taxes. Well, the farmer's got the best balance sheet of uh, the four basic segments of uh, private enterprise. The poorest uh, operating statement of any segment. The poorest operating statement. And, and he uh, hasn't making enough money to hold on. He, he's not making enough to support his family. He's really uh, in a depressed area so far as his personal income is concerned. All right, well, now, Harry, as a banker's viewpoint, you've heard Mr. Bauer say that agriculture's got the, the, the best balance sheet of any segment of our economy. But would you agree that even so, that uh, the only way that agriculture can liquidate its debt is by liquidating itself or selling out? That's what has been happening. That's All the way right. it's been done. Now, we talk about, uh, we haven't had many farmers go bankrupt because they see the handwriting on the wall and they've taken the step of voluntary liquidation to make the change. But, but now, if this is a condition of agriculture and they've got the best balance sheet, better than the corporations or the small business and so forth, uh, as a banker, what's your observation of the rest of the economy then? Well, of course, we've been encouraged in deficit financing. We've been told that that is the way to get prosperous. We've had the Keynesian theory that we increase our debts, thereby we do more business, and so we, be, as we uh, owe this debt to ourselves, it doesn't matter, and we become prosperous. It as doesn't disappear, does it? No, the debt doesn't disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Paulson, uh, in other words, uh, and the farmer has been staying in business by increasing his debt, though. Uh, he's been. There's been this inflation, which has caused a markup in the real estate values, which has enabled him to borrow more money on the basis of that so-called increase in real estate value. And as a result of this, this is what's been keeping our rural communities That's alive. What's been keeping them going. There's been this increase in debt. Mr. Paulson, in other words, what we're the point we're getting at here is that agriculture has a better balance, but actually small business in rural America is in worse shape than agriculture. Is Absolute, not, not absolutely. That's the point I wanted to bring out. And Carl, uh, you heard uh, Mr. Bowers make the statement on the balance sheet of agriculture, and I think we'll agree that they've got a better financial statement than the corporations and small business. Why don't you point out the seriousness, uh, the seriousness of this? Well, the uh, simple facts are that uh, agriculture in terms of uh, gross farm income is uh, receiving 49% uh, of what they call parity of income. But on a net basis, uh, the net farm income is only 33% of a parity income for the farmer. Now the farmer, if he didn't uh, work long hours and work his family, just couldn't stay on the farm. He'd have to get out. That's how one of the things that has made it possible for him to stay there. Well, have we credited much of the efficiency in agriculture uh, uh, to the fact that, they, uh, that they, uh, they've that they been producing for half the income they should? That's what do you mean by that. Well, in other words, they say that the reason that agriculture doesn't deserve a price anymore, like they did back in the 30s, uh, is because they've become much more efficient and they've increased their production uh, through technology. Well, that's... Uh, that's why they don't need the price. Well, that is what's been told to the American people, but here's the fact. In 1946, they had a net income of uh, $15 billion. In 1966, it was $16 billion. But in 1966, their operating costs were $3 billion more than all their income in 1946. Mr. Bowers, uh, in your estimation, what is the biggest problem in agriculture today? Well, the biggest problem today is how to get farm income back to the same level on a parity with what the farmer has to pay in consumer prices. He's, he's a buyer as well as a seller. And well, how does he restore his parity of income with a parity of income with other segments of the economy? And my feeling is my little town, it has a sales volume of $5 million a year. 
should have a sales volume of 10 million a year if they could restore the income of the farmer to a parity of the people who produce the goods that he buys. What's going to happen if we don't restore the parity income of agriculture? Well, our little town's going to disappear, and that's why I came to this conference. I want to know how, what we're going to have to do to keep our town from going out of existence. All right, well, what effect is this going to have on the national economy if we don't restore well, the... Well, it means there'll be vast uh, open areas of uh, agricultural country in this United States that will not be any longer operated by this small individual family unit. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bowers. I see we're running short on time. Would you agree, Carl, with what Mr. Bowers said? What's the number one problem in agriculture today? Well, the number one problem, the only problem there's been in the history of the United States, and that's price. So what's the answer? You should demand that Congress immediately restore the 90% price support with an accurate parity formula based on the consumer price level. And the record proves from 43 to 52 that this program worked effectively and efficiently. And the source of this information can be found in the 1962 economic report to Congress by President John F. Kennedy. I want to make well, that point you. that that needs to be based on the consumer price level. That's the governing factor that tells the story of what the parity price should be. Why don't you repeat be. the statement once more, uh, Mr. Rash? That we need 90% support prices based on a parity price level governed by the consumer price level. Under the 1962 Under the President's 1962, Economic Report. Yeah, President's 1962 Economic Report. Would you agree with these other two gentlemen that the biggest problem in agriculture today or the only problem is price? Yes, sir. How about you, uh, Ray? Well, I certainly agree with this too, Arnold, because when farmers are being only paid half what they should get, they're only spending half of what they could spend in rural America, and this is why my town, if things aren't changed, is going to go down the drain, just like Mr. Bauer's town is. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is what we've been discussing at the Blue Ribbon Conference in Sioux City, Iowa, uh, this past weekend, and uh, it was the unanimous agreement of all those that attended that the only problem that we have in agriculture today is the price structure and that all of rural America is completely dependent on the gross income of agriculture. And if the farmers don't get their proper share of the national income, it's going to starve the rural communities. And uh, one way that we could restore prices to agriculture is through legislation such as Mr. Uh, Wilkins and Mr. Bowers and the rest of the panel agreed. However, we've been trying this now for 15 years and it seems like Congress has lost sight of agriculture. And so this is what the National Farmers Organization is attempting to do. Merely one thing, to restore the proper price level to agriculture through collective bargaining. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has presented a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of the nation's outstanding leaders. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.